Hello, welcome everyone to Taste Canada and Canola Eat Well's presentation of Cook the Books 2021 Educational Awareness Program. My name is Jody Robinson. I'm a registered dietitian and definitely a foodie, and I am your host today. I'm going to be talking to you today about food and nutrition trends for aspiring culinary professionals. So you're definitely at the right place today if you're looking to boost your culinary creativity with such things as healthy cooking techniques, menu planning, and healthy ingredient swaps. You want to learn how to adapt your menus based on current trends, for example, gluten-free eating and plant-based eating. And also you're looking to create new and innovative dishes based on up-and-coming food and nutrition trends in 2021. So we're gonna get started today talking about some of these top food and nutrition trends. So food and nutrition trends, they change all the time, but I'm here to talk to you today about some of the most current ones here in 2021. All right, so one of the top ones is international favorites. So everyone's cooking more at home these days, but people are getting a bit of kitchen fatigue. So rather they're looking for takeout, dining out if it's available, and they're looking for interesting flavors from Southeast Asia, Korean, Middle Eastern, Mexican, and generally any sort of international fusions. Number two is veganomics. So what this basically means um, is that plant-based in general is a huge trend, but people are looking at their familiar favorites and looking, how can I make this more plant-based? So for instance, taking something that's usually made with meat, say nachos, and instead using um, diced up tofu on those nachos instead. So be on the lookout for those. Number three is more faux protein options. So I'm sure you're familiar everywhere from A&W to McDonald's to Burger King, every place is having some sort of faux meat burger available or sandwiches or lunch meats. So we're going to expect more of those on the market at even more restaurants this year. Number four should not come as a surprise is immune health. Because of COVID, everyone's looking to strengthen their immune system however possible. So look for dishes enhanced with immune boosting nutrients, for example, vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. Number five is alcohol-free drink options. So this one might come as a surprise, but believe it or not, people are on the lookout for just better, better health and well-being. So they're looking for lower calorie options. They're looking for zero alcohol options. And there's a lot of companies these days creating liqueurs that taste and look just like regular alcohol, whether it is gin or tequila, um, but it's completely zero alcohol, so alcohol-free. So be on the lookout for some of these options with different mocktails and different zero calorie and low alcohol drinks. Number six, functional foods. So a functional food is a regular food, but it's enhanced with something to give it added health benefits. So you may notice like at the grocery store, seeing orange juice, that's a bone health formula or a heart health formula. So you take a regular food and then you add something to it to give it that nutrient boost. So be on the lookout for more menus and recipes featuring some of these functional foods to overall boost the nutrition of that recipe. Number seven is naturally sweetened foods. So people are becoming more and more aware of some of the hazards of having too much added sugar in the diet. So too much added sugar can be related to increased risk of weight gain, chronic disease, and tooth decay. So rather, people are on the lookout for ways to naturally sweeten their foods instead. So natural sweeteners would be fruit, fresh fruit, dried fruit, also herbs and spices. Spices like cinnamon and nutmeg are great ways to naturally sweeten our foods. Number eight is gut friendly foods. This is also linked to immune health because there is a big connection between our gut health and our immune system health. So look for more dishes featuring probiotic rich and fermented foods, which are a great source of probiotics. For instance, kefir, yogurt, kimchi, tempeh, all of these are really wonderful sources of these gut friendly foods. Number nine is sustainable food systems. So people are on the lookout to reduce the impact on our planet. So looking for more envir environmentally friendly ways to package foods and to create foods. So this is definitely on the rise this year. Number 10 is healthy habits. So I see this more and more with the clients that I work with. So people want to be healthier, but they don't want to sacrifice their favorite foods. And they're also very, very tired of all the quick fix and fad diets that are out there. People are looking for good health in the long run. So 
What I mean by that is taking favorite foods and making things just a little bit healthier, whether it's mac and cheese or lasagna, which I'll show you an example at the end of the presentation today on exactly how you can go about doing that for your consumers. All right, so up next, we're going to talk about two trends that are not going away anytime soon, and that is gluten-free eating and plant-based eating. So what is gluten? Gluten is a protein found in grains such as wheat, rye, barley, bulgur, spelt, and triticle. So gluten is a protein. Its job is to act like a glue in these grains and in baked goods, which give them basically like their spongy texture, their soft spongy texture. So thinking about the rise in bread or other baked goods like muffins and loaves. And this is also why in a lot of gluten free products, you tend to sometimes see products that are a bit drier, a bit more crumbly because they lack that gluten. So gluten is a really important element of a lot of these grains. However, for some people, they're unable, unable to have gluten. And why is that? So in one case, it may be because of celiac disease. So celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder. And someone who has celiac disease Basically, gluten is toxic to them. It really honestly is. Even as much as a little crumb of a piece of bread can cause damage to that individual's small intestine. And that's the part of the digestive tract that is needed to absorb all the nutrients. So if it gets damaged, that individual can have a lot of problems um, and develop nutrient deficiencies. So we need to be super careful that anyone who has celiac disease is avoiding gluten 100%. It's the only treatment for celiac disease. Alternatively, some people do have gluten intolerance, and this is more generalized. It could be digestive complaints or feelings of unwell. Um, and in that case, people are also on the lookout for avoiding gluten. So again, we need to be really careful in these instances that, are, that people need to reduce the gluten or avoid the gluten completely in their diets. So here are some foods that commonly contain gluten. So of course, breads and baked goods made with grains that contain gluten, crackers, soups, broths, pasta, cereals, sauces and gravies, salad dressings, beer, uh, brewers, yeast, soy sauce, and different malt foods. Now, on the market these days, there's loads of gluten-free options to choose from. You can see them everywhere. Unfortunately, not all of them are as nutritious as the original. Okay, so we need to be really careful if people following a gluten free diet often lack fiber, if they're choosing a lot of these highly processed alternatives, but the good news is that they do exist, and they can be used when you're developing gluten free recipes. In contrast, there's lots of naturally gluten-free foods. So there's a whole list here. So everything from all produce, produce foods, so fruits and vegetables, um, starchy vegetables like potatoes, dairy foods are naturally gluten-free, all fresh meats, fish and seafood is as well. Plant proteins like legumes and soy-based products like tofu are naturally gluten-free. All nuts, seeds, nut butters, and nut flours also are. And also there's loads of gluten-free grains that are available. Everything from rice, buckwheat, millet, amaranth, and oats. Now it is important to be careful, especially for those that have celiac, to make sure that where they're getting their grains or gluten-free grains are made in a facility that has no cross-contamination. So be on the lookout for those. Now with these naturally gluten-free foods, sometimes you need to be careful with how they're processed in general. Like anytime any of these foods might have a, um, a breading coating or some sort of sauce or marinade with it, we need to be careful because some of those items can certainly contain gluten within them. Now, if you're a fan of baking and you're looking to do some more gluten-free baking and consumers are definitely on the lookout for gluten-free baked goods that taste good and have great a really nice texture similar to regular gluten containing baked goods. Um, but at the same time, it can be a challenge to find that right texture, but it's not impossible. Nowadays, gluten free flour blends, typically, you can find an easy substitute of one for one. So instead of using one cup of all purpose regular flour doing one cup of a gluten free flour blend, but they tend to be lacking in, uh, in fiber, protein and vitamins and minerals. So what can you do to counter that? So it's pretty easy. There's some options that you could consider like adding some nuts and seeds to your baked goods or even to the flour itself, doing something as simple as ground flaxseed can really boost the fiber and the protein of that gluten-free flour. Almond flour is another option. You can use almond flour in itself for doing some baked goods. 
If you're doing any sort of cooking where you need like a starch or a thickener, right? And normally if you'd use like a flour-based uh, thickener, instead potato starch, tapioca starch, arrowroot, or cornstarch are some great alternatives. So as a chef, you do definitely wanna make sure that when you're in the kitchen, that you're being very careful to avoid any sort of cross-contamination with gluten and regular foods. So you wanna store gluten-free foods separately. You wanna make sure that they're not being prepared on the same surfaces. You want to also make sure to avoid um, cooking and baking in the same uh, appliances or pans, right, to avoid any cross-contamination, using different equipment as well, including bowls and spoons and anything else. It's also careful not to deep fry gluten-free foods in the same oil as regular foods because there could be cross-contamination with that. And even things as, like toasters and microwaves, so anything where there could be even, again, that crumb, you don't want it to be able to contaminate the gluten-free food. So keep an eye out for all of this. Okay, great. So that is gluten-free eating. So now we're going to move on to the next trend that, again, is not going away anytime soon and, if, if anything, is growing, and that is plant-based eating. So what is plant-based eating? It consists mostly of vegetables and fruits legumes and pulses like beans and lentils, whole grains and nuts and seeds. And then plant-based eating also has le less or little of any animal-based foods like meat, poultry, fish, seafood, dairy, and eggs. But it's really important to differentiate that plant-based eating does not exclude all animal products. So sometimes there can be a bit of confusion that about plant-based eating versus vegetarian or vegan eating. So someone who is vegan will not eat any animal-based foods, no meat, no fish, no dairy, nothing. Whereas someone who's vegetarian um, will avoid meat, but they may or may not include things like eggs and dairy foods and fish or seafood. Whereas plant-based eating, again, it means you're putting a focused on these plant-based foods, but you're not necessarily reducing or excluding those animal-based foods from your diet. You're just having them in a lesser amount. So where did all of this hype about plant-based eating come from? So I think it really started back in 2019 when Canada's Food Guide, the new version, was released. So the new food guide that was released encourages people to choose protein foods that come from plants more often. And you can see in the portion of the plate that has the protein foods, again, a lot of those soy-based foods and beans and lentils and nuts and seeds. So why is this? Because all the research shows that these plant-based proteins are so rich in fiber and they're lower in saturated fat. Why is this important? Because this helps to lower the risk of chronic diseases and just helps improve health overall. So in terms of how plant-based eating helps overall, so besides that improved health, it also has environmental benefits. So there's less environmental impact um, when we create plant-based foods versus source animal-based foods. So less planetary impact, we need fewer environmental resources and less of a carbon footprint overall. There's also a reduction in food costs, right? So this is always great when you're working in a kitchen looking for ways to save, save some money and reduce your expenses. So thinking about plant-based foods, you need less electricity to cook them, store them, prepare them, and just, you know, dollar for dollar, they do cost less than most animal-based foods. So to showcase an example, here is a simple recipe. So split pea and ham soup. And this really does showcase what a plant-based recipe looks like. Because if you look at the comparison of the ingredients, it's not that the plant-based version excludes meat. It still has the ham in there, but it has a lesser amount of the ham. Because people still love meat. And meat is nutritious. It, it, it is. It's a great source of protein and vitamins and minerals. But because we know how much benefit there is to having a greater amount of plant-based foods to the diet, we want to emphasize those in our recipes. So you'll notice in the plant-based version, there's more vegetables, more uh, aromatic vegetables in particular to help enhance the taste and the flavor, more herbs and spices, and more plant pro proteins. But they're both still very similar. And then what you get for this exchange is a 25% cost savings. So that's pretty good when you're looking to save money in the kitchen. So what else do plant-based meals offer? So the shelf stability, right? So they're 
not as perishable. They'll last longer. They're extremely versatile. Um, you can really, I'm going to show you some examples, but really you can use plant-based proteins to create pretty much any sort of recipe that's out there. They taste great and they really absorb the flavors of other foods and herbs and spice as well. So you really can create great tasting products and overall they're convenient and accessible. So here are some very specific ideas on how you can go about adapting recipes to be more plant-based. So common recipes are things like burgers, tacos, meatloaf, shepherd's pie, burritos, nachos. So again, things where you often use a lot of ground meat in them. So it's not about taking that out completely unless maybe you did want to go vegan. But if you just wanted to go plant-based, it would be replacing maybe a quarter to a half of that meat with beans or lentils. And once you uh, work that in with the ground beef or the ground meat of any sort, you'll really hardly notice a difference at all. Things like chili soups and stews are also another great opportunity where you can be including some of these plant-based proteins. So for example, you can puree white beans or soft tofu into potato or cauliflower soup. You can also replace half of the meat with diced tofu in chili, which believe it or not is, is a huge hit. Things like sandwiches, wraps, and pitas. So typically you would use things like, you know, mayonnaise might be a common condiment. How about instead using hummus or mashed avocado? So it really boosts the nutrition and the protein of those recipes. Salads and bowls are very popular these days. Things like rice bowls or Buddha bowls. So you can add things like roasted chickpeas, edamame, which is baby soya beans, or pumpkin seeds, or a combination of all of the above. Now here is what show what I call consider plant-based nutrient boosters. So these are common foods that maybe you don't want to exchange the amount of the meat, but maybe you just want to get started by adding additionally some of these plant-based foods. So things like hemp seeds, tofu, avocado, red lentils, pumpkin seeds, chickpeas, and again edamame just to name a few. So think about your recipes that you're creating and developing and simply ask, is there a nutrient booster that I can add to these to make them more plant-based? Okay, great. So moving on to making recipes healthier. So how to's, tips, and tricks. So there are different ways or reasons to modify a recipe to make it more nutritious or for a specific health purpose. And in some cases you want to add certain nutrients. And in some cases, you want to reduce certain nutrients. So what might those nutrients be? So again, in general, the nutrients that we want to boost up to make the recipe healthier would be fiber, protein, and any vitamin or mineral. And nutrients you'd want to reduce to make the recipe healthier would be calories as a whole, and what we consider the three S's. So this is saturated fat, sodium, and sugar. So these are four ways I'm going to walk you through and how to make a recipe healthier. So number one is to change or add a healthy technique of preparation. A simple example to this would be if your recipe calls to saute, say, onions and garlic and butter to swap that out for canola oil, which is a much heart healthier choice. Number two would be to change or add healthy cooking methods. So if a recipe calls for you to fry or deep fry something, ask, can I bake or grill it? And then you'll save a lot of fat and calories. Number three is change the portion size. So typically a lot of um, dishes, especially at restaurants are very large, like high portions of protein or grains and starches or minimal vegetables. So you could change that up, lower the grains and boost the vegetables. Number four is to reduce, eliminate, or replace an ingredient. So I'm going to walk you through some slides that gives you specific examples on how you can go about doing this. So for example, if a recipe calls for mayonnaise or sour cream, try plain Greek yogurt instead. And by making this swap, you're going to get more protein, a less saturated fat, and more calcium. But be careful, don't use non-fat versions if you're heating it up because it's more likely to curdle. So the fat helps to protect the protein in the yogurt from curdling. Another idea is that instead of one cup of butter, try one cup of pureed avocado. This is a great option in a lot of baking recipes and you'll get less saturated fat, more fiber and more folate, which especially is an important B vitamin for women's health. 
Likewise, instead of using one cup of melted butter, you can use three quarters of a cup of canola oil. So canola oil is a really heart healthy oil. Um, it's lower in saturated fat and has more omega-3. The last idea here is that instead of using one cup of chopped nuts, try using half a cup of toasted chopped nuts. So toasting really helps to enhance the flavor of the nuts. So this will help to control the calories in your recipe. Here's some more ideas. So instead of one cup of all-purpose flour, which is a refined flour, um, use ha just half a cup of the all-purpose plus half a cup of whole grain. So whole grain is the full intact grain, which has more fiber, more vitamins, and more minerals. Another idea is that instead of using one whole egg, use two egg whites. So by doing so, you'll get fewer calories and saturated fat and more protein because the white is just pure protein. Another idea, um, and this is great in baked goods, is that instead of using one cup of butter, you could use half a cup of butter and then half a cup of unsweetened applesauce. And that helps to mimic some of the, the purpose of the moisture of the butter. So overall, you'll have fewer calories and saturated fat and more vitamins and fiber. Lastly, instead of one cup of sugar, you really can get away with, in a, especially baking recipes, using half to two thirds a cup of that sugar instead. So overall, less sugar and fewer calories, and you really won't notice a difference. You'll still get that sweetness that's needed for the sugar in that recipe. Okay, so up next, it's about focusing not just what on to replace or leave out, but again, what can you put in to boost the nutrition of a recipe? So here's some other examples of nutrient-rich add-on ingredients. So there's a variety of different ingredients here. A lot of them, again, are plant-based, but there's also milk. So milk is super nutritious, very, very nutrient rich. You can use it in things like smoothies, smoothie bowls, baked goods. So anywhere that might call for water, ask, could I use maybe some milk to help boost the nutri nutrition of that recipe? Any sort of fruit is a great add-on as well. Um, salads, again, baked goods as a garnish for a recipe as well will help boost the nutrition. Any sort of nuts and seeds, again, are great additions and nutrient boosters and oats as well. So oats are a whole grain that are really, really high in a nutrient called soluble fiber that helps balance blood sugars and lower cholesterol levels. And it's very versatile to be adding into um, a variety of baked goods, especially. So to modify a recipe, there's five things that you kind of want to think about um, when you're making that modification to kind of sum things up. So number one is the nutritional analysis. So think about who your target audience is. And this is important because if you are creating recipes for, say, an um, older adult population, maybe at high risk or managing of chronic diseases, that's a lot different than if you're catering to a younger population that's maybe highly active. So make sure to get to know who you're developing and, and cooking for and then um, tweak your nutritional analysis based on that. Number two is the flavor profile. So this one is so important. So at the end of the day, we're talking about nutrition. Nutrition is so important, but it's not more important than the overall satisfaction of the recipe. So the satisfaction, the flavor, the taste is just as important because people, the number one reason why people choose what to eat is because of how it tastes. So yes, it's fantastic to improve the nutrition, but you want to always optimize that overall taste experience just as much. Number three is thinking about the functions of the ingredient. So is the function related to um, giving the product rise to its texture, to its taste? A good example for this one is thinking back to when we were talking about swapping out all-purpose flour and we said half all-purpose with half whole grain. That's generally the better way to go about it because if you use full whole grain flour, it would create a more dense baked good. So again, finding that kind of happy medium allows for a more nutritious product, but also a product that still gives that nice soft texture that people are looking for when it comes to a baked good. Number four is cooking technique. So again, we talked earlier about a few different ways that you can modify a cooking technique to make it healthier. But also think about like, for example, if you're doing something like authentic deep fried chicken, it probably wouldn't make a lot of sense to turn that into baked version, right? Again, so look, think about what the overall outcome of that product is that you're looking for, and then alter the cooking techniques in a reasonable and realistic way. And then number five is the overall acceptability of the modified product. So think about those ideas to make it more nutritious, give it a go, and then do your sensory evaluation. 
test it out, see what you think. And be prepared that it often takes more than one try to get it to really where you want it in terms of combining the nutrition along with the taste and the flavor. So here's an example to kind of wrap everything together that we're talking about today in terms of these food and nutrition trends. So lasagna is a very popular common pasta dish. And if you were interested in going about, again, giving it a nutrition makeover, this is maybe how you could go about doing that. So instead of using one pound of ground beef, which this traditional recipe calls for, you could do half a pound of ground beef with a half a cup of lentils. The recipe calls for Italian stewed tomatoes in a can, could you alter that for doing fresh tomatoes or no salt added in a can? Tomato paste is fine. You can keep that as it is. Um, the recipe also calls for minced garlic. Could you, but only half a teaspoon. So could you bump that up? Give it more flavor with more garlic. The recipe calls for two eggs. Could you do one whole egg and then two egg whites? Next on the recipe is cottage cheese mixed with ricotta cheese. That sounds great, but instead of one and a half cups each, try one cup and then add in some pureed white beans and this makes the recipe more plant-based as well as the lentils that we talked about. Uh, the Parmesan cheese, usually you can reduce that. Again, you wouldn't notice much of a difference between one cup and three quarters of a cup, but you'd save some calories and fat and sodium. This added salt to it, you could probably reduce or eliminate it altogether. But what you could do instead is add in more herbs and spices for flavor. So things like fresh minced parsley, thyme, and oregano. Lasagna noodles are typically white refined noodles. How about swapping that out for whole grain? Again, boost the fiber. And then if it calls for a lot of mozzarella cheese, keep the cheese, but could you do partially skimmed instead? And that will lessen the fat and the calories. So these are just some ideas, again, about how to go about tweaking some of your favorite recipes um, so that they abide to more of the current trends, including plant-based eating and just generally making them more nutritious overall. All right, so to sum things up today, um, Really, so everything that you've thought of or everything that I presented and you and you saw today, what are you ready now to bring to the table? So gluten-free, plant-based eating, alcohol-free, gut-friendly foods, natural sweeteners, healthy recipe makeovers, immune-boosting foods, functional foods, faux protein, and sustainable food systems. So give it some thought and think about these going forward in 2021 when you're working in the kitchen. So thank you so much for um, staying tuned right to the end today. Again, my name is Jody Robinson. I'm a registered dietitian. If you have any questions about the content at all, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email address is there. If you're looking for more information about canola oil, please contact Lynn Weaver at Canola Eat Well. Or for more information regarding Taste Canada and Cook the Books, please contact Sabrina Falone. So again, thanks so much for watching. Take care.